Hey, thanks. It's Bear Gardener, and I am back. I am finally actually back to making YouTube videos. It's been a while. I've had some internet problems, and stuff's been going on in life, and it happens. But anyway, uh, I asked on my Discord uh, about what people would like to see as a return to content creation on YouTube, and you can find the links down below. As ever, I'm a Cards content creator, member of the Cards contributor program. Uh, pretty much known mainly, I think, as being a, a new player, advocate, strategist. Um, I'm all about trying to improve your Cards experience, I guess. Anyway, I was join my Discord. You can have some great conversations there. I have some fantastic people. I'm very, very lucky to have some extremely good players and lots of very friendly people there. But when I asked on my Discord what would be the video that people would most want to see with me coming back to content creation now that the internet's working, um, the main answer was a conversation about the current meta and the decks that are in it. And I guess it's kind of a survival guide. I don't really know. It's going to be just a conversation for me about what's out there and how to approach it, um, what decks you're going to face how to play into them, but also I got asked some really interesting things about psychology, so that's also going to be pretty cool. So first and foremost, to give you some context, um, I, I've made Field, field Marshal this season. Um, you can see, like, literally all of it somewhere on this channel, um, if, if you have the time. I think I've there's a two and a half hour video, which is at two times speed, uh, of... 95% of the games I played on my way up to Field Marshal from rank 6. Um, there's a couple that were missed because they were either played on mobile or recording didn't work, but I even managed to record my mobile games and cut them in there. So you might see the occasional notification pop up on screen and stuff. You can see what real life looks like. But anyway, you can actually see my journey to Field Marshal on the deck that I played. That same deck, Air Exile, I will put a link down below to the, or the deck description, but it is just one deck that is out there. But it is the deck that I have primarily been playing from the point of view of competitiveness, and we'll kind of get to that in a bit. Um, but I, I have then, I have since then been into and out of the top 100. I'm consistently in the top 400 or so, if I can put the time in. Occasionally I'm dropping because, quite frankly, I don't have the time to put in to, to really climb, but I'm, I'm getting a pretty good zero, I think, on what's round. What's interesting to me, and it's very fascinating to me in talking particularly to other players, is the difference between what I'm facing, um, at, I suppose what you would call the upper end of ladder slash the elite level of the game. I don't like that word, but it's, it's relevant. I guess you would describe many of the players that I play into as elite players. And I don't get quite the same experience that you may well be having if you're at Field Marshal or climbing up to Field Marshal, because there are certain deck archetypes which you are going to be playing into a lot, which peter out um, as you get to the upper echelons. And th the reason for this is, quite simply, that the uh, top players do not want, or at least wish to minimise, the random element as much as possible. I want to play a deck that's consistent. I want to play a deck that is, if I'm piloting well, is going to crank well past a 65% win rate. Um, and uh, some of the, the frustrating decks that I know you are playing into, and we are going to talk about them in a minute, don't fit that criteria. Uh, I also, if I'm climbing, which I'm currently not, but I know people who are uh, in top 100, don't want to be running... 15 minute fatigue games unless I am of the opinion that I'm going to win 90% of them or really probably closer to 80% would be good enough but you would need a higher win rate if you're going to have to spend longer on a game because the reality is you still need to get your elo your score high enough to get into the top 34 to compete that means you have to win enough games to raise your rate and doing that when you've got 15-minute uh, games is unfun and very time-intensive. Not saying it can't be done. In fact, there may well be someone out there who's doing it, and well done to them if they have the time for it. But generally, I want something faster with 
somewhere between 65 and 70 percent win rate because then i can crank out enough games to get there anyway that's a very quick overview of what it looks like to play at the upper echelons relevant because i'm going to talk about the difference between your experience if you are not playing on upper ladder and the experience up here so i asked in discord for people to point out the the decks that they were particularly interested in i guess dealing with finding it difficult to play against and a couple came up that are very relevant so the first thing that was brought up so the two that came up almost instantaneously are push uh ramp retribution and a third one was the mill package now we're going to take the mill package and put a pin in that and put it to one side because i call it the mill package for a reason and we'll discuss it shortly let's start with one of my favorite decks the irony if if the irony is lost on you dig around on youtube you'll, you'll you'll find that i have fairly strong views on the retribution mechanic and the fact that the the pool that you develop from without rage needs to be changed anyway i know a lot of you are playing into ramp retribution and i've had a lot of people asking why this is the case and also how to win games so firstly why is this the case because it's a really strong archetype right now ramp retribution is very i'm going to preface this ramp retribution is not i'm not going to list any deck here as low skill i've seen way too much of this on discord facebook and other places where people talk about zero skill decks no successful deck in this game is zero skill pilot skill matters end of it's been proven endlessly and i'm not going to go round and round forever and a day doing it um there is a, a confirmation bias in our heads as players that when we see a deck that is consistently successful we want to put it down to high roll i'm going to get personal with this because i'm going to call myself out because other people might do i currently i'm playing an awful lot of exile air which is us poland uh, sorry brit poland with a focus on aircraft i endlessly see this deck described as high roll you win because you get hammer home early onto uh, an ms406 you're wrong my numbers prove you are wrong if the deck was high roll then i would not be able to achieve top 100 and a consistent win rate on it because i'm not playing that many games i could if i just spammed lots and lots of games and got onto it but i don't have the time for that i play maybe an hour or so a day on ladder sometimes a little longer sometimes a bit shorter and i play some games on stream you can go watch me play exile on stream you will notice i do not only win when i high roll and have the ideal hand in fact if you watch my field marshal climb video you'll watch me win games in which i have a terrible starting hand and use the tools that are available to beat my opponent that's skill it's no ego intended here a factual statement but it's necessary to get this point across because i'm kind of tired of seeing it the endless negative psychology of it it's not helpful this is not about low skill decks versus high skill decks this is about archetypes that are predominant right now and why so back to ramp retribution why is ramp retribution so predominant right now because it is a relatively forgiving deck it has a decent skill ceiling but it has a low floor for forgiving mistakes because retribution as a mechanic is an exceptionally strong recovery or uh fight back mechanic because if you trigger it right and learn how to trigger it right with enough credits available and that's what ramp is doing for you is giving you the credits you can keep digging until you find the cards you need to come back this is why us ramp retribution us brit being the most common version is heavily played right now it is a solid archetype that leverages very strong cards and a very strong mechanic in an efficient way 
Do I think there is a problem with the retribution mechanic? Yes, I'm on record as saying so. Absolutely, positively, I do. I believe it needs a fix. Um, but I'm not going to get into that because it's not what this is about. Do I believe that we should consider anyone who's playing that to be toxic or problematic or any of the other words that I see you? No. Honestly, the, the, building that much negative energy into your gaming experience makes me concerned for you. Genuinely, if you are the kind of person who is feeling like this, maybe you need to step away for a bit. Just a thought, because that kind of negativity constantly being in your head, which it will be when a deck is predominant in, our, in, in, in the meta, is not healthy for you. But uh, the other side of this is, can you beat Ramp Retribution? Yes, I do regularly. You can see me do it on stream, you can see me do it in videos. It is very beatable if you're good, but it's hard because you will occasionally get frustrated by the fact that they have a seemingly endless pool of removal and recovery tools. It's the, the best advice I can give you, and I endlessly give this advice, but this is a good time to emphasise it, is if you are finding this in two ramp retribution, slow down. Play your turns slower. Think very carefully about what you're going to put down and how you think it will interact with ramp retribution, the way it's on board, and what they might have. Also, and I give this advice endlessly as well, and you might not like it, Get a hold of a ramp retribution list, go play it. Play it in casual if you're not a big fan of playing it competitively, but play it. Get to understand how it works, because by understanding how it works, you will start to see cracks that you can impact. I have a personal distaste for it. I do not enjoy the archetype as a player. I think personal, I don't, I'm not going to throw any negative connotations at it or describe it as toxic or destructive or any of that but it does not suit my playstyle. I don't like it. Uh, I don't like having to fish for random cards. However, I've made the effort to put time into understanding the list, talking to people who are very good at playing the list and learning how to use it so I can beat it. It does have weaknesses. Uh, you can go under it, by which I mean win quickly. Often it is quite valuable against, if you suspect this is what you are going to play into, it is often worth hard mulliganing for early aggro tools, whatever ones you might have, because this the game doesn't the deck does not have a good early game. It we can get to you, but it normally needs to get to five or six credits before it can start being a serious problem. Now, it can get there relatively quickly, but uh, it, it's effective. Also, if your Brit main, Ultra, uh, is... Normally, I would say try and time your Ultra for very specific cards. If you are on Brit Air and you're running Ultra, and therefore you're playing what I will mm, collectively describe as support line aggro decks using that ultra to buy you early time by denying credit gain is valid. Same is true in Exile Air. Uh, I use the countermeasure that cancels the deployment effect to remove the deployment effect on the unit that gains a credit slot and gives you HQ defense because it buys me an extra turn of operation and often that's all I need. In the mirror match, you just need to be aware if you're playing your own deck into it. Um, if you're playing a slower, more control deck, you need to pick your targets. Um, if you have access to it, you need to use Suppress, particularly to deal with anything that's going to generate outrage. That's my advice. You can beat it. It is frustrating, and it does have a very, very heavy comeback. Um, there is a point at which the comeback mechanic can become very hard to manage because A, they likely have enough credits to use it, and B, if they've been able to proc either blue and grey or yank, 
they probably have enough retribution cards. The so the mathematical chances of getting, by the way, and this is something that I want to make clear. There is, I think, there's something like a forty some odd percent. I don't have the exact number on me. Chance on each proc of outrage that you will get to develop two retributions. That is a huge thing, because that is how you access the toolbox. You will see it happen. Anyway, that and Yank allow you to access the toolbox hyper-efficiently. It's a thing. But we'll see. Anyway, that's the, that's my advice into that deck. Uh, so that's Ramp Retribution. Um, push. Push OTK. What can I say about this deck? Um, push is a mechanic that isn't going anywhere, evidently. I'm not quite sure why it isn't going anywhere, but it isn't. I think possibly because it's not seeing a lot of competitive tournament play. We'll get to that in a minute. It's kind of being overlooked for the impact that it has on negatively on players. Push is strong right now. So push, for those who don't know, is the use of the push card, which is the card that costs that deals three damage to your HQ, and then you deal damage to the enemy HQ equal to the amount of damage that your HQ has taken this turn which on the face of it is not that great. However, if you play two of them, because they're a special, the second one only deals three damage to you to deal all the damage that you dealt the last time, which is all the damage you've taken, plus three to your opponent, while you only take three, which is how push OTK works. You burn your HQ defense to do massive damage. Any 20s, low 30s are very doable on push OTK um, to do it. Now, there are two ways that this is regularly approached, and it is relevant to see the difference between the two lists, one of which I actually think is better than the other, but we'll get to that. There is the core Soviet main list, which generally wants to use um, Great Patriotic War, Sorry, memory issues. Um, it's part of my illness. Uh, but anyway, yeah, Great Patriotic War, which is the order that sets both HQ's defences to 12. Because that then makes push super easy. With a little bit of US ramp, you can have enough credits to uh, set your HQ and your opponent's HQ to 12 and then play just enough damage that they die and you don't. I don't actually consider this to be the better of the lists because it's more inconsistent, because it's hyper-dependent on an elite that you really need. Uh, and also having the credits to play it on the, the curve. Right. The second version of this list that is going around at the minute, and in my opinion the more efficient one, is Brit-Soviet push, or Soviet with Brit ally both of which are leveraging Aerial Reconnaissance. Aerial Reconnaissance is a British countermeasure. It's a standard card? It's standard. Because um, you can run four of them, which you hold up, and when your opponent deploys a unit, you reduce the cost of all orders in your hand by one. This means if you use the draw to get the tools for your OTK in hand, which you can definitely get because Britain has a draw, then just wait for your opponent to drop a couple of units. You can literally push OTK your opponent for free. This is very strong. Something to be aware of. If you see the countermeasure triggering, you are almost certainly on a clock. So, how to deal with this deck? first thing is to recognize what this deck is and what this deck isn't. This deck is kind of an auto win if you can pull it off because it's non-interactive. Unless you have a countermeasure like Sisu or something Talbot. Um, although Talbot's not that great because it's only going to proc against the first one so they can still do enough damage to put you in trouble. Um, there are, but unless you have something that can directly counter it, or you can time your ultra perfectly, once they have the tools in hand and are in a position to do it, there's not a lot you can do. Um, 
What this deck isn't is consistent or reliable. The reason this deck is not consistent or reliable is that you're not always going to get there fast enough, and it is very vulnerable to overdraw, because you don't want to be running a lot of units in this deck, which means you haven't got a lot of ways to empty your hand, but you have got a lot of draw. This deck hates playing into mill, which we'll get to later, because it can discard important parts of your combo. This deck doesn't like playing into light unit decks, because the other thing that is relevant to this is that to trigger push, OTK effectively, there has to be a unit on the board that they can target with Red Dawn. Otherwise, the entire thing doesn't work because they have nothing to target, which is why sometimes you will find they run some big trusty units of their own. Glamour Boys is a big favourite. Finally, on the subject of Glamour Boys, Push OTK can be completely neutered through efficient aggro. Focused HQ defense totally neuters the archetype because it needs enough HQ defense to survive the damage it needs to deal to itself to deal the damage to you. Some decks are more vulnerable. US Frontline, for example, is incredibly vulnerable to push OTK because it has no HQ defense gain. Jagro, same deal. Although Jagro has a slightly better matchup because Jagro is very fast. These are basically my tips for dealing with it, which is be aware of how it works so that you can look for and counter it, and also accept the fact that sometimes they're just going to draw the cards, proc the countermeasure, and there's nothing you can do. You, you, there, there is occasionally nothing you can do against it. This is true, by the way, of most decks. That there are very that there are just you can have games you will have games where you play incredibly well make no mistakes and you lose. Very notably, some time ago, uh, I pulled into ladder, uh, and I, I I drew some F Jack J Queen some chap who's apparently quite good at the game, and we played a match. J King, I'm kidding. Um, you know, I love you, man. But we played a match, and I lost. And J King sent me one of the most important things that I ever receive from good opponents, and I've had this from other players like Bubbles and BVG and other top players, which is, good game. I didn't see you make any mistakes. That is important. I am generally accepted to be pretty good at this game, Jaking is exceptional at this game. It is possible to play perfectly and lose because you have slightly less good access or timing than your opponent. It happens. You can only focus on improving your own game. You can't just, I've done whole videos on the fact that you can't change the opposition. Go watch some of my game theory videos. Psychology we'll get to in a bit as well because it is relevant to this. Right, next archetype which was brought up and the elephant in the room, Mill. So, uh, quick story time, how did we end up here? Uh, Mill's been in the game for a while, it's high pressure, it takes lots of intelligence to play well, but played well it is incredibly difficult to beat. However, it's never been that popular. Then, a couple of things happened. Firstly, we got rid of Commonwealth, which was a thing, but it wasn't always essential. Secondly, we had the arrival of Compromise. Now, Compromise, I called out when I looked at it, and so did some other people. Hey, it's that bloke again. Um... Weird Canadian popping up all the time. Curse him for knowing the game. In all seriousness, we pointed this out publicly, videos, conversationally. A compromise was always going to strengthen Mill. On paper, it doesn't look like it should. Because if you proc the one that causes your opponent to draw cards, you're also giving your opponent HQ defense. And it's not really bad, because in the end you want to bring it... No, it's not. Because Mill does so much damage. Get to that in a minute. Anyway, so Compromise came along. The next thing that happened was the OCC. The last OCC 
an incredibly capable and intelligent player, did something very smart. Henry, who won the OCC, spoilers, you should go watch, by the way, it's, if, if you want to understand Mill and think about how to beat it, you should go watch. Henry looked at the meta, the most common deck being ramp and or high-end value decks, and went, what's really good against these? Mill. Mill is good because it can take it to fatigue and they're not well equipped to beat it because you're discarding all of their important tools and denying them presence. He then did the second half of it. Now I have openly said, because people know that I do as OCCs come round and I see the quals, I will theorycraft my own decks, the three decks that I would bring if I was to compete in the OCCs. I'm never going to, unless something changes, I'm not going to compete. People do ask me regularly and I get the why, but it's just not going to happen, it's not something I want to do. For that OCC, two of my lists ran France Ally and were Mill. For the same reason that three, that is all three of Henry's lists, ran France Ally and were Mill. Because I saw the same thing he did. A meta that was going to be vulnerable to it. You were going to get favourable matches. I wasn't sure. I really wasn't. I had a conversation with my wife about this one. Walking around a nature reserve talking about it for the OCC. She's very understanding my wife. She's very, she's in my Discord. She doesn't talk about cards very much, but she's around. You can say hi to her. Um, and she's very understanding. She will talk to me. She, she is a smart woman and picks up enough about the, the game to have a conversation with me about things like meta so that I can bring stuff out. And we had this discussion and I was like, I don't know whether this is going to work for Henry or not. It seems like a smart move, but is it a bridge too far to have brought three? Turns out it wasn't. He won. Super efficiently. He lost one game. Not one game in the final, not one game in the semi-final. He lost one game in the OCCs. One. Anyway, this brings us to the two things that have caused Mill to become present. Now, I did go on stream the OCC after party. It's probably still on Twitch. You can probably still see me saying this, which is a pleading with people not to assume that this meant that you should build mill decks and go on to ladder with them, because it is not a good tool for laddering currently, because it does not have the consistency that the list I talked about previously did. That is still true, but we are still seeing it. You are seeing it. Notably, I'm not seeing a huge amount of it at top end. I'm really not. The reason I'm not is it's terribly inconsistent and we don't want that. You're seeing a lot of it because it feels cool and if someone can win the OCC dropping only one game, it has to be like a super auto win deck of doom, right? No. So one of the things to be aware of, and there are people who are, there are mill haters out there who are not going to like me making this statement, but it doesn't make it any less true. It takes pilot skill to win on a well-built mill deck. Facts. Hard work. You need to time things very carefully. You need to thoroughly understand the matchup that you're playing into and where best to deploy your control tools. You need to be able to be aware of the content of your deck. You need to manage your hand to not overdraw. And then you need to time your actual mill tools perfectly. This is not easy, which is why mill is beatable. Takes me to the next point. First thing against mill, and this is where we're going to get into psychology, and please, if you're going to pay attention to one piece of advice I give about playing into mill, it is this. One of the biggest reasons you're losing to mill on a regular basis, if you are, is that you are allowing yourself to get tilted. You're letting it get in your head. Don't. I know it's hard, I've done videos on this, it is hard, but slow down, calm down, and remember, this is not a deck that is just going to beat you. If the pilot is good, really good, you're probably screwed, unless you're on the right deck. 
any good fast aggro deck will be a problem for it. There are a couple of unitless decks that it doesn't like, and you can do quite well counter milling, but outside of that, against a good pilot, you're probably cooked. Against an average or less than average pilot, your odds are actually probably pretty decent. And how do you identify how good the pilot is? If you deploy a couple of units on turn two and suddenly they honour and loyalty them off the board, chill. I know it sounds like you shouldn't. Really frustrating, oh god, my, my start is gone. Chill. Th this person, nine times out of ten, there are exceptions, because there are times when you need to do this when you recognise a specific threat, or you know that your hand isn't providing what you need, is over-enthusing about their mill tools and forgetting that they have a limited number of them, which means that they're probably not going to remove your late-game threats, which are the things that are going to win you the game. Which leads me to the second point. You're not going to necessarily... You're either going to win early by just going under it, and being very fast, or you're going to win late because they have not efficiently managed their mill tools and you are able to keep a one or two damaging units on the board and plink their HQ. Because the other thing you're going to do is learn to use the feature if you want to be okay into this matchup that allows you to see deck size. You can click on your own deck and it will show you the count of cards in your draw deck and their draw deck, that's when you start to, to do maths. And some of you may not like this, but doing maths will help you into mill. What you need to understand is the impact of the gap. Bubbles talked a lot about this really, really smartly. I really enjoyed his coverage, by the way. Bubbles, great job covering the OCC. Talked a lot about this in understanding, as did Spoos, actually, and the two of them were chatting quite a lot about the, the difference. They were fixating on the difference in deck sizes. The reason they're fixating on the difference in deck sizes is this is how you judge your chances into mill. If you are two or three cards down, as your, cards are, uh, your deck's a couple of cards short, it's not that bad, because three cards down is one, three, six damage, because you take one for the first overdraw, two for the second, and three for the third for a total of six. Five cards down, one, three, six, ten, fifteen. It's exponential. Controlled draw is huge especially if you are playing anything that has a draw engine. Yak, the draw yak, especially considering it also damages your HQ. 22 regiment, tw the 22 infantry from Germany. These are cards you need to be very careful with because they continually draw you cards and you aren't always able to turn them off. Playing Mill, if you ever see me playing Mill, you quite often, especially if I'm on Frontline or something similar or Jagro, you'll see me push my draw engine to the front line. The reason I'm pushing it there is so that I can sack it when I need to. When I see the gap getting too big, I will sack it so I don't keep drawing, because I don't need to help my opponent. Right, next thing is Mill's best matchup is Ramp Retribution. Kind of what it's built to beat. Um, it has other good matchups, but that is by far the thing that it is super efficient on. Anyway, this is kind of my point. You, you can you, you can do it, but a lot of the losses you you might experience against Mill can be psychological um, because you need to not get convinced that you're going to lose. Because if you think that this deck is going to beat you you concentrate less on your plays and thus make it more likely that I've done a whole video on this, but you make it more likely that you lose. I want to talk about a tool that you should try. And it's going to sound ridiculous and you might think it's ridiculously new age wellness wanker or whatever. It's fine. You can have that opinion, but try it and then come back to me. You'd be surprised. 
when you feel the frustration build, use what they call a um, a, a controlled exhale, or it's also sometimes called the safety net breath. So you can close your eyes if you want to, but the main point is to breathe deeply in through the nose and then exhale slowly through the mouth, through pursed lips. That long exhale activates your parasympathetic nervous system. Factual statement, you can go read the medicine on it, which causes your body to go into a state of non-sleep rest, which reduces your anxiety and stress and increases your focus. And yes, one breath can be enough. You might actually spot me do this. I'm fairly good at masking it because I do this in everyday life. It's a technique I use all the time. And quite often I'm doing it mid-conversation and situation. So I've learned to kind of mask it into what I'm doing. But the reality is it works. You might spot me doing it on stream. Keep your eyes open. See if you can. Try it you'll be surprised how much it might work. So those are the, the, the three decks that were most talked about, as does people coming into and finding difficult to beat. Other stuff that's currently in the meta, which, by the way, I consider to be relatively varied at the moment. Um, Jagro is still good. Uh, both the classic German ally variant and the salvage Finland variant seen a fair chunk of those japan poland legions low key give it a go you'd be surprised if you can be patient enough and you don't mind playing the value game that's pretty good uh oh germany finland heinz um that's that's around the heinz for those of you who are watching this who are the newer players and get confused by this has nothing to do with beans sadly which makes me sad but that's a brit thing um Heinz is named for a card called Fast Heinz, which is no longer in the game anymore. But it basically boils down to a very fast tank deck. Um, there are quite a few doing the rounds at the minute. Jir US Heinz is out there, Jir Japan Heinz is out there, Jir Soviet Heinz is out there. Soviet Germany Heinz is out there. I'm going to see a lot of it, but it exists. Um... But Germany, Finland, Heinz, as of recording, is pretty good. I've played a few on it. it it's decent. Uh, Brit Air, normal US ally and Soviet ally, both solid decks, um, well playable at the moment. Uh, they are, these are, by the way, the back end, this along with our exile, are what I call the support line aggro deck. Uh, Baron von Glower. I'm responsible for giving me that phrase, and I like it. Um, they are all aggro decks, because um, they, they, they're not really interested in a late game. Like, Brit Air has some late game tools, but really these decks want it to be over soon. Um, they're pretty good right now, but they are beatable. Again, you can go under them, and you can stonewall them with removal. Um... Not a lot of control around at the moment. Um, there really isn't. Um, strongest control deck I currently play is Soviet Italy control, but it is very pilot intensive. You need to be very good to win on it. Um, no shade cast on anyone, but it's factual. My experience tells me this. Um, uh, what else is it? Oh, Frontline. We have to talk about Frontline. Frontline is good right now. Not amazing, but good. Uh, might need some help. It can be a bit. It has some not great matchups. Um, commandos, you might be seeing at lower ranks. Trust me, the, the, the more you climb, the less you'll see it. Again, it's janky. It's fun, but it's janky. Covert, um, you might see a bit of. There are some interesting, what I call hybrid covert list, covert lists out there. Um, I'm not taking credit for them, there are lots of good people who develop them, but a while back on stream, I, I, in a new player stream, on an alt account, I was playing a what I called at the time a hybrid covert deck, um, which used some good frontline tools from US, um, along with some blitz tools, and then followed up with covert. This is the thing, and it's pretty good. 
Uh, I don't think it's going to be super competitive, but it's definitely playable. Um, what else is out there? Uh, I know uh, Leo on Bill Bill did some streaming with the Germany Poland Legions. I had a look at that deck. It's pretty good. Um, it's pretty fun. Um, and I think that this is probably OSKD. Uh, Self-credit denial is still out there. Uh, mostly as a Jagra variant, although low-key. I actually think the Japan Soviet version might be better. I, someone somewhere will find out whether they agree, but I personally have found the interaction between uh, 51st Recon and Respite to be very powerful. And it fits surprisingly well into an SKD package, into the shell. Blitz infantry that gains plus health. I mean, 51st Recon is the, the Blitz 2-2 two -two infantry from Japan, which every time the enemy HQ gains health, gets an equal amount of attack. Respite increases its defense and increases your opponent's HQ defense, which means if you've got a couple of... you can see where this goes. Anyway, you might see me stream it at some point. It's an interesting deck. The classic German ally one is also pretty good at the minute. Um, these are these are probably the things you're most likely to see. Um, I I don't want to babble on endlessly. I'm I, I'm not going to claim this is going to be a short video, but it's short for me because it's probably going to come in under an hour. Um, mind coming under forty five minutes. These are the things that you're likely to run into. As always, I hope it's helpful. I hope it's interesting. If you want to see me talk about this more or ask me more questions about this. Comments are down below, as is the link to join my Discord, where you are more than welcome to reach out and chat to me. If the link is expired, because it's a thing and I can't afford to pay for Discord Nitro so that my links don't expire, conversations about that coming in future. I, I've been asked endlessly about am I ever going to allow anyone to support me. At the moment, I haven't got the best model for it, but I'm looking at it. Um, Twitch subs are one thing, but we'll get there. There'll be an announcement video probably in the next week or so. But I can't afford that kind of effect. So if the link has expired, hit the card's main Discord and just at me. You, you can get me. Uh, I, I am not hard to find. Um, you're, you will get me at Bear Gardener, and I'm... 2605, so I'm at Bear Gardener, brackets 2605 on Bear underscore Gardener, uh, on the cards Discord, at me, and I'll get you the link, so you can join my Discord. You, Everyone is welcome. The rules are very simple, and I have some great mods and people you can talk to, and you can ask me questions there too, so if you can also reach out to me on social media if you want to follow me on Instagram and all of that stuff threads, X, I sort of exist on X, kind of, um, but yeah, find me, ask me questions, if you want to see more of this, leave comments down below, and questions about other things you might like me to discuss, because I'm always looking for new content ideas. Meanwhile, I'm just glad to be back, I hope this is useful, I hope you enjoy it, and as always, stay well, be good human beings, and I will catch you next time.